Welcome to Own Your Zone Podcast, where we feature venture capitalists, innovators, angels, and other investors who create positive impact globally. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm Janan Glasgow George, patent attorney and founder of NeoIP. We're a law firm who helps clients maximize their return on investment for patent assets. I'm also host of this show, Own Your Zone where we feature venture capitalists, angel investors, and innovators who are making positive impact in the world. We're also doing a Women in VC series, and my guest today will be part of that very special series. This episode is brought to you by NeoIP, where we help companies increase their valuation and protect their business through strategic intellectual property protection. We provide corporate and legal services, helping companies manage risk, develop portfolios, and monetize their IP assets. We believe that ideas are the one true unlimited resource, but they're only valuable if you transform ideas into assets and use them to make positive impact. Find us at neoipassets.com. I'm delighted today to have with me Elizabeth Cook. She is a leading women in VC investor with AI Capital and also an investor and startup advisor for companies in AI, tech, and biotech, all associated with MIT, huge innovator, clearly. She's been a resident scholar with MIT and was the first hire at MIT.nano, their largest capital project to date. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course. So AI, it's now, it's the future, it's forever, probably. Tell us how you got interested in AI and maybe back up a little before the AI capital. Absolutely. So I'm actually formally trained as a stem cell scientist. I went to MIT for undergrad and then for Cambridge in England um, for grad school. And I realized I didn't want to to have my own lab, that I actually wanted to get into the world of startups. And through a series of fortunate events, I was leading a startup program at MIT, spinning out super early stage tech and biotech companies. And I was working for a lab that was really cross-disciplinary. And I started to see that in the business models and in the technology of these startups, that AI was playing a really interesting role and and kind of where the actual AI had an impact on business that would eventually be spin out and run out. And I thought that that was so interesting to see because it was starting to affect things cross-disciplinary. And that's when I started to say, okay, I think that AI is a really interesting um, tool in the Rolodex that different companies can use um, to to really kind of propel their business forward in an interesting way. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm with you on the role of AI. And also in my IP practice, we do look across all sectors, all industries. And it's amazing. It seems almost like AI has no limits. Do you see limits today or what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a great question. So I feel like a few years ago, we were really skeptical. What is real AI? Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, someone would present us with a spreadsheet and I'd be like, that's, thank you so much for sending this, but we're going to recategorize you this. We don't feel that this is AI. But I think that we really did hit a tipping point and are in third wave AI where the companies that are using it are really, it's really interesting what problems can be solved. And um, at the conference that we met at, there was an example about how Cheetos was using this fantastic AI application. And I really like that because it's, it's in our food. It's, like really a part of our life in a way that's very different to how I thought about it, right? I'm a big Terminator fan. So, and, and actually we have a lot of (laughs) prospect LPs that ask essentially the question of, are we investing in Skynet? And that's, 
that's hilarious, but but in a very good way, we have transformed kind of past a lot of the feelings of Skynet, I think, and are seeing AI applications that are are really useful and interesting. Yeah, it does seem that AI might have a a little bit of a marketing uh, issue, right? Yes, yes. I noticed this actually kind of first at MIT Nano, and that was really helpful um, for me to think around the marketing of AI, but no one can really, you can't say like something is Nano and have someone understand how that's a part of their life. You can tell them, do you enjoy the mayo that's on your sandwich, which is an emulsion, which is, that's all Nano. And they, and they get it. And that's part of their life. And I think in the same way, AI faces some similar challenges around how do you hear the word AI and see how that can actually be helpful to you in your life? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I imagine uh, with your venture fund, you are still running into, is this, is this the level of AI? Is this application important mm-hmm. enough? Do you mm-hmm. think uh, to make impact and to really make positive impact in the world, do you find that you're filtering a lot? Yes. Yes. So I think there are two very helpful filters that we have in the fund. One is that we only invest at the A round, possibly like a little before, but the stage is really important. And that stage is important because um, our companies have some revenue coming in. So we validated that the, either the way they're using AI works, someone is paying for it. Yeah. Um, and then also our fund thesis is very specific and that we only invest in enterprise applied AI companies. So that's a company doing B2B, not B2C, um, and then enterprise applied AI. So Neville and I like to say that we don't invest in science projects, but that's (laughs) that's kind of like creative exploration of our messaging for how to say that we are interested in AI um, applications versus AI technology as well. And I think if we look at being third wave AI, versus second wave, that there were a lot of acquisitions for buying core AI technology that happened maybe like three to eight years ago, but we're in a different stage right now. And I think from an investor perspective, it's I really enjoy seeing the different applications of AI in different industries. Makes sense. It makes sense. So you're de-risking at the stage uh, of your investment. IP, intellectual property assets, are another way to de-risk investments from a venture capital point of view, right? Because even if the management fails to execute on the plans, they still have created some assets that could be valuable to someone else. What are your thoughts about that? And how do you guys screen the... um, how are you screening on IP? So uh, I feel that IP is kind of its own incredible company strategy that really there should be some level of expertise around because if it can be done well, the value that can be added um, both in a very positive, but also to create kind of a, a defensive um, front for the company as well, I think is is really important. I also think that not very many people know how to do this well, even from, you you could say, the startups that come out of MIT where they have an incredible advantage of the technology in general tends to be very good. But then the level of expertise that you have, it really is expertise of where you, you kind of can't just acquire these skills of how do you think about your patent portfolio? How do you think about the patents surrounding Um, Do you really have a community of patents? What does that mean? How does it serve your products? How are you thinking about them when, and a little bit of this requires visionary thinking, right? Which is when you're designing the patents, where is your business, but actually where are you going? And by the time that they're issued or by the time that you have your community of patents, what does the portfolio look like? Exactly. And dates matter, right? The priority dates. It's important always to be screening for that. But to see some consistent growth over time, we're noting from our IP 
uh, tracking software padded forecast that investment in really all areas of IP um, for application of AI, like medical diagnostics. Uh, yes. I think that's a, that's kind of in your area or in your space. What are you noting there? What are you seeing in that sort of fusion of the biotech, the analytics, and AI? I think that area is so primed for AI in such a good way. Like if we think about the volumes of data that we have in health and in diagnostics, it it's actually an overwhelming amount of data. And then if we think about the US healthcare system, which the data is incredibly siloed and fragmented, mm -hmm. like that is just primed for excellent AI to make, to, to really be a useful tool to, to bridge things together. So I can actually share a clinical example that I like. So some patients that have chronic conditions on average, they'll have 400 pages of medical records. Wow. And they often see like not their PCP. So they'll see a specialist. They'll see another doctor. What if they walk into the ER? They'll see someone that they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And then just can, like, can you imagine being that physician trying to a find that, like, where does that data come from? Yeah. It, that's impossible to go over in a few minutes, even if they have a few minutes before seeing the patient. I also feel like the patient is there because they're sick. Is it their responsibility to accurately share all of their health information, all of the tests they've ever taken? No, this, this is primed for excellent software tools using AI to show what if you could have an on-demand um, clinical report that shows what the patient is presenting, highlights, okay, what are the big risks? Is this person, for example, pre-diabetic, but what should be looked at and maybe some recommendations of how they could be better treated? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I had a, a good chat with uh, Neville also about this idea of valuing data. Data is obviously a huge I'm not going to say side effect, maybe input, you know, it's a huge part of AI, of course. And the value of that data, I think, is underrepresented for most companies. I have noted that many companies aren't very vigorous about negotiating for data rights, and yet the, the data is everywhere. Um, one case in point is the Oracle acquisition of Cerner. We were just talking medical records, over 200 million medical records and a 24 billion plus uh, deal. And yet the data was only valued about 150 million or less. It seems I know opposite of what we would expect because cost of replacement pretty big, right? Maybe 10 billion. So um, what are your thoughts on valuing this data around AI companies? I think it's super interesting. I'm also kind of actively watching. Like if we do that math, then we can say that Oracle got a hell of a deal. Yeah. Really? Yeah. We have a portfolio company um, called Syndesis Health that is looking at non-US um, healthcare data. And that's been really interesting to try and learn some of the ways that data is, the, the value is assessed. And usually there has to be some sort of transaction where either you're selling part of it of how to price. And I think that's also really interesting because if we think about basically any company where data is not their main business, yeah. they're not going to prioritize the value of that data. And you know, and then often the data gets undervalued because they don't have the expertise. And often they also don't have the time they're focused on running their core business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree with you. It's really interesting. For it's certain a potential big game changer for a lot of companies that I think they're unaware about. I think so. We are certainly advising clients to consider data as part of their IP, right? Even if it's not in your core business and to ensure that you are negotiating pretty aggressively to try to be sure you have the data rights, you own the data exclusively, or at least have rights to it. 
and any derivatives, they analyze data. Um, obviously, it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. And for how do you help them on pricing? Or yeah, it's a fascinating question, and you know, of course, uh, uh, much more opaque. Uh, uh, when you're looking at the private sector, it's just experiential and, you know, the the uh, primary research we can do from talking with others. But when we're looking at public companies, I'm seeing a big uh, contradiction there, right? I mean, if we're looking at some of the big tech, super big tech, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and acquisitions, we're seeing data valuations being low, right? Do they benefit from telling everyone how valuable their data is? I mean, Everyone uh, has an eye of skepticism probably toward all big tech and the data that's there, and yet they're valuing it really low. So it's almost like we can't talk about how valuable data is in the public domain. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's really interesting. Uh, uh, I feel like I agree, and I think this is why and really this started when we have this portfolio company that got, it, it kind of spun out a whole healthcare part in part because of figuring out part of this value. Mm -hmm. I feel like actually you have the expertise, but I'm like actively watching <laughs> in, in this space. And I feel that the data will be valued more, but I'm, I feel curious to watch kind of how that actually is going to happen and then how it's going to be monetized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and this is not just us. I'm talking globally, but um, we'll just consider this one growing and learning in real time for sure. It's a, it's an amazing new aspect of intellectual property that I think has to be integrated with the traditional IP assets that companies have and that they are careful about how they launch things from the start, for sure. This is so fascinating. Tell us a little bit about who inspired you or which funds even have inspired you or that you um, are keen to observe in venture capital. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would say I've been a, Fred, a fan of Fred Wilson pretty much since day one of of being a VC. I followed his blog um, the whole time. I think he's also an MIT alum. Really interesting. And I think in a way I got lucky for being a VC. I had a mentor named Alan Hanover and he invited me to found Caster Ventures with him. And I think he saw something that I was unaware of at the time of how I would just love it. And it, <laughs> it's, it's actually really a gift to be able to do something for work that you feel is aligned with your gifts. Um, and, and that is really a joy every day. But I, it, I felt like a kid in a candy store when we founded Caster Ventures to work with the entrepreneurs, to start the fund from scratch, to talk with the MIT alums who we had never raised a fund before and to have them trust us with their precious capital that was that was really an incredible start and to start by looking at um industry geography stage agnostic startups we could look at anything as long as there was an MIT alum that was an excellent way to start in venture cuz i looked at everything and then now i'm able to with the ai capital thesis which is so specific zone in on on really specific startups that I also love and I love our thesis but I think that was a gift to be able to start in venture where it sounds um, like it uh, I'll I'll admit I have I have um enjoyed joining venture funds as an LP um as a, a natural extension or progression of uh, my angel investing and mm -hmm. being able to scale impact I think it's um mm -hmm. it is an incredibly fascinating area venture capital it is yes before. yes i'm a personal angel investor as well and it's interesting how i feel very differently about my angel investments than the fund investments um okay. and i was told when i 
actually when we started Caster Ventures that a lot of angels have a hard time making money because people tend to have because startups are so risky, especially in the early stage. And I think I came to watch like of my 35 super early stage MIT spin out, there's no way I could have predicted which companies are thriving today and which ones failed. And so I think that's a really difficult burden that angel investors take on, which is that they're trying to de-risk usually by investing in a field that they know. Yeah, I've done this for sure, for sure with two of my investments, but also I like being a part of the fund where we can invest a little bit later stage, but there, there's something I think about the angel investments that are closer to your heart and your, <laughs> your, your, <laughs> you're really rooting for those founders. Yeah, for sure. A lot of, uh, the angel investment that I have made, it is in companies where the management team, the vision, the industry, you know, our data aligns with it, but where we feel in the UIP that we can make a difference uh, with their IP assets because they're starting most of them from scratch and without the strategy and the data and the vision that we help them craft in alignment with their business vision right? Um, I think those have been rewarding just for working with them through it. Not everyone will make it, of course, but I think it increases likelihood of success. So like you, the industry agnostic uh, part of me just loves learning and trying to make positive impact, but to do it efficiently with a capital too. It's a fun space. I agree. I agree. So tell us what's... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it also sounds like you're the best type type of angel investor who's actually helping the company. That IP help is incredible. Oh, for sure. I do. I definitely, my pattern of success is at some point to roll up my sleeves and get involved. I'm a, I'm, I've been very active as a board member with early stage companies as well, bringing contacts and resources to bear. It's fun. It is a fun day for sure. Well, tell us what's in the future for you, looking ahead in the next year for AI Capital. You're raising money now. Talk to us about what's next. Yes. So um, we are raising our second fund now. We are aiming for a $100 million fund, um, again, focused on the same thesis, enterprise applied AI, um, doing B2B investments. We had the first fund, which was primarily friends and family. Um, at 8 million, we had a, a special SPV where we could raise more money for one of our portfolio companies. So we have a total of about 10 mil, million of AUM, but it's, it's, we really love our team. We have a really good track record from the first fund, which is such a gift. And we learned that our thesis is good based on kind of the returns profile of the first fund. And so now it's about growing the, the second fund. Love it. Love it. So tell us, Elizabeth, where can our listeners reach you or find you or find out more information on AI Capital? Um, at our website, um, which is ai.vc. Very good. Very good. Well, wishing you all the best uh, as you are fundraising and for your companies that you invest in. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Own Your Zone podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.